All right. So this week we're joined by Lauren Cox from Lockdown Bears. Pretty much all the social media platforms at Lockdown Bears. The main topic here, I think, that really kind of clouds the Bears fan base is the quarterback conversation. This thing has really kind of turned into a civil war, especially on the internet. It's it's amazing. I get comments all the time that say, the choice is so obvious. And I'm like, okay. You know, we do have different scenarios that could play out here. Whether we keep fields, whether we get a young new quarterback, whether we go out and try and get some type of veteran, um, whatever Ryan Poles may think is the right way to go is what's going to happen. But do you have a preference and have the bears given any hints to what they think they will need from that position moving forward? Yeah, I, I agree with you hundred percent that anybody who thinks it's clearly and obviously one way is definitively better than the other, I think is oversimplifying it or not, or, or not open-minded enough that both possibilities have merit in a lot of ways that's a good problem to have either you believe in fields and that's great and he can develop and step into a bigger thing or you really believe in a rookie quarterback and that you think that player could come in and be the next great quarterback and like either way ideally then you're getting a good quarterback like whether it's fields or the other one you believe one way or the other like you should have two good choices not like you know you're trying to decide between you know terrible quarterbacks in this process so to me, from the beginning, it's like, all right, it's a good place to be where it's like, if you didn't have the number one overall pick, you'd probably just be rolling with fields anyway and not having the same conversation. I, I think personally, I'm, I'm kind of at the point now where I don't think it's an obvious choice, but I do lean rookie quarterback there. Like to me, I would like to keep Justin Fields and draft the rookie quarterback and try and do both. Find a way to make it work in the locker room. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be the number one overall pick for the quarterback, but certainly draft one in the first round, early in the first round and set it up so that young quarterback is your quarterback of the future and that clearly you're saying publicly Justin Fields is not our long-term quarterback of the future and hope that you have a head coach either the current one or a new one that is strong and stable enough to withstand that in the locker room and, and we have seen locker rooms be able to get through that in the past but maybe not a locker room with as much public support behind Justin Fields I mean it's hard to it's hard to compare apples and apples to, to previous circumstances but I still think give me as many shots at a good quarterback as possible instead of hamstringing me into just one or the other. Why not both and see if either one turns out to be good. Me and Paulie always go over the the, mo the model and the mold that people are saying that field is going to follow, right? So last year was Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts, right? This year now, I'm in my opinion, like if you want to keep fields, you got to try to do some sort of version of the Miami Dolphins model, right? And if you're blowing it up, now you're trying to copy the Texans, right? Go high early really get like a good young offensive staff in there. D'Amico Ryan's defensive, but either way, and then you're trying to rebuild. So it's like a version of a model that you've seen before, right? But when you talk about Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts, people don't mention the fact that they sat for an entire full year. You talk about Justin Fields has to make the third year jump. Well, the guy also didn't get a year of like no scrutiny, no pressure, not getting his brains bashed in and then like learning a system that was consistent. Oh, and also that coach left the first year also. So he started over year two. And then additionally, whether or not you want to look at it this way with the NFL, because going even back into last year, how many times the Bears lost the game in the last second or the last play? Same with this year. A lot of this is luck, right? Like you have the first overall pick again. Yes, because Carolina is bad, but also because you're like super lucky. Because if Carolina wins one or two more games this year, and you have now the ninth pick of your own, and you have, let's say, the sixth pick. What are we talking about? Are we talking about what two guys to put around fields to make him better? Or are we saying, can we package six and nine to go get one? Because I don't think that that's the like narrative that you'd be hearing right now. Because if it was a little bit different, you would be talking so differently. You would have such different ideas. But because you've lucked into this situation, now it's obvious. If you get rid of fields, I don't want another carousel of quarterback. Because I, I like what you said, Lauren. I'd like to get an early pick at quarterback. and then you know, have him sit for a little bit, but you can't do that with 1-1. One, one. You can't even do it with like 1-2 or 1-3. I don't want a 1-1 one, one pick at quarterback again with a coach that's stuck around and then a guy who didn't get handpicked again, and then you have the same narrative. The first two choices that we keep talking about and hearing about, I don't think are actually going to work because they've been proven not to work. You just fire everyone, bring in a new coach and a new and a first overall rookie quarterback, and it's just going to work. And then you keep the old guy and it's just all of a sudden year four developmentally, it's going to work. I don't know. I think you have to find the nuanced choice here. And I think Ryan Poles is patient and smart enough to do it. 
but I don't think either of these two obvious choices are actually the right choice. I really don't. You don't hear this very often because it it's, hasn't been said very often. Um, Matt Nagy was right. He was right to sit fields early on. And the problem is when you're in that last year, you wind up getting desperate to keep your job. So fields went in because Andy Dalton got hurt, right? So he went in due to necessity from injury. However, the longer that season goes, the more you need to do something to show that you are worthy of staying here, you know, for the next year or so. And that's usually when those quarterbacks wind up getting tossed in anyway. And it's kind of funny because here we are, our rivals, the Packers have literally shown us the path that has succeeded twice now. Well, I mean, Jordan Love first year, still got more time to go. I've seen guys work out in their first year and still bomb. However, it's on that trajectory. It's on the trajectory that he is working out. I really don't want this to feel like the last year of Matt Nagy where you have this new draft pick that's just sitting there waiting to go. I would rather do the opposite. I, I think I would rather get a new coach in here to try and fix fields or get more out of them while having another quarterback from the draft early in the draft or first round quarterback in, in the back waiting and, you know, getting better and getting ready to start. This idea of, of drafting and, and sitting a quarterback and, and trying to give that time, like, yeah, like, I agree. Like most of the time you don't see a, a quarterback drafted one, one or one, two, or, you know, sitting on the benches rookie season, because of course you draft him that early because you think he can be the guy, but the vast majority, if not every time we've seen that in the last handful of seasons, the teams drafting one, one and one, two are, are picking their because they're really bad football teams. Like sure. We saw the Panthers trade up. We've seen teams trade up in that spot, but like the teams that are drafting up that high end up being, really bad football teams. And so they don't have a good or, you know, really sustainable alternative at quarterback for that spot. And so they have to roll those guys. But the exception there is kind of Trey Lance with the 49ers a couple years ago. They traded up to three. It's not one or two, but still top three. And and sat him for not the entire rookie season. They ended up getting him out there. But the plan was not to get him out there early because they either felt good enough about Garoppolo, felt like they could still compete with Garoppolo, and also train and develop the better thing behind him. And certainly Trey Lance is not the outcome you want for the bears but to me that feels like the way to try and go about it is say listen like we totally believe in drake may caleb williams or whoever you're picking at the quarterback spot and maybe it doesn't even have to be at one you know maybe you could trade down to three and still take Jaden daniels or you know whatever quarterback you like from this class but like i i think if you're a good enough team with a good enough quarterback option ahead of them it's easier to get away with all right we can sit this highly drafted rookie and still believe in him while still going with a veteran quarterback kind of, you could argue week one, Caleb Williams might not be the better NFL quarterback than Justin Fields. So you could justifiably say we are starting fields until we feel Caleb Williams is the better guy and treat it like a Alex Smith, Patrick Mahomes type of situation where maybe it's only a full seasons or whatever it ends up looking like. But as soon as Caleb's ready to go, everybody loved Alex Smith in that locker room. But there was an understanding that like, yeah, this Patrick Mahomes guy has the higher ceiling and is the better quarterback. I know it's not apples to apples with fields, but it feels like we have seen that formula play out on a couple of different teams and they've been able to find ways to manage those personalities and those dynamics, just not exactly this exact situation. It's something we haven't seen before really in Chicago. No. And the teams that you're mentioning though, and me and Paulie have mentioned this a lot about the bears and what the way they're doing things right now, they haven't earned that right. Bill Belichick does that and he can do it because he's earned that right. Andy Reed can draft a quarterback at, 10, I believe. Andy Reid's earned that right to sit Patrick Mahomes and then play Alex Smith. And if anybody scrutinizes, he goes, I'm Andy Reid. I've got this. We're, we're good. The Niners have a built-in system of production of like, nobody even questioned the move up to Trey Lance. Everybody was like, damn, did they just sneak in at three and get the best quarterback? Because they're the Niners. And I think the Bears should do that. But can they do that without it looking controversial? It's going to be the unpopular opinion because, again, we keep talking about the Civil War. It's cut and dry. Bears total, if you don't move around in the draft, if you include Ian Cunningham compensation, the Bears will have seven total picks this year. A first, a first, a third, a third, four, five, six. Or I believe four, five, seven. That's so like now you're bringing in Caleb Williams, a first overall pick. You're keeping fields. You're not getting compensation to get a second round player that draft. Now you're hoping Fields works out. You can trade him for something later. It's such an unpopular opinion, and it's such a controversial decision. It could be the right one, probably is the right one. I think you're on the right path there. It, it speaks to the importance of 
having the right head coach and an offensive coordinator and having the right staff in place. And the, there's a separate conversation here. It's like, okay, like there's, there's what the bears should do at quarterback, like what's best for their long-term future at quarterback. And also like, if Matt Eberflus is entering a lame duck year, is that the best time to draft a quarterback? We haven't heard anything about Matt Eberflus's future yet. And although we don't know exactly what's going to happen and it could surprise us all, there is a good chance that Matt Eberflus will be here. So Lauren, I'm going to ask you, what does he bring to the table? that's exceptional that another coach couldn't bring. And when you do think of the elite coaches in this league, is there anybody that you could compare his traits and characteristics to? I think it's a great question to ask and I, and I will try and answer it, but I, I think that's the question that not a lot of, not, not enough people are asking themselves. Like, this bears defense clearly played better in the second half of this past season. And Matt Eberflus is the defensive coach. But like, if you think about like what, what Matt Eberflus does on this defense, like, what has his role been in this defense playing better? It's it's really hard to sit here and pinpoint like the specific thing or things that Iberflus does really, really well as a head coach or a defensive coordinator. Like he's not calling, you know, the, the world's most creative coverages, right? He's not he's not coming up with, you know, crazy disguises or just brand new ways of thinking or shifting coverages or certain calls, like adjustments off of certain coverages that guys are adjusting to and like you know, they're passing off routes in a certain way that is really innovative or creative. I don't know that we uh, can objectively say like, this is the best way to, but like, this is the percentage of cover two that you should call versus the percentage of cover four. Like there's no way to, to really like measure and pinpoint, okay, Iberflus is calling the right mix of coverages better than other coaches are calling the right mix of coverages. So like, to me, the answer, like to answer your question is very little, right? There's very little that Matt Iberflus that I can see that we can measure in any real way that Matt Iberflus does at a highly exceptional, effective level that other coaches wouldn't be able to do. You know, I don't know if devil's advocate is the right word there. Like the thing that he does exceptionally that other coaches can't do is that he's been here for two years. You know, he knows all of these players on the roster right now better than any coach coming in from the outside would. Probably the only thing I could think of as well is at a point where we got four turnovers against the Lions and still blew that lead and lost that game. At the end of that, I said, this team's done. They're not going to try – as hard for this coach again and next week they did so i i give him credit for not losing the locker room during losing because yeah when you're winning it's easy to hold a locker room together but when you're losing that's when it gets bad and that's definitely a positive like that he's got that for sure he has the faith of the locker room a lot more than if any every new coach that we brought in would have to build that faith up and he already has some of that and that's it's not meaningless. That's not nothing. Sure. Like it's good and important that the players do like him, but it feels like any coach who wins, the players will like them. the players like to win. And I guess give him credit for holding the locker room together last year during a terrible season where there wasn't much winning and players could have easily kind of turned on the team and given up and not tried hard. And like he deserves credit for some aspects of leadership and, and locker room management. One other thing is that, you look at you do look at the coverages the Bears ran this season, uh, first four weeks of the season, right up to the Washington game, week five, and they had the mini bye week afterwards. From that point, drastic change in the coverage calls that they used. Like week one through five, when the defense was really bad, they set a lot of cover two, a lot more soft zone, not much man coverage. After week five and on, they, he definitely like you can see in the data like looked at what he was calling as a cover in terms of coverages as a play caller and changed it, and it was much better from that point on. And like he deserves credit for that in terms of self-scouting and not being so married to his cover two system from the past that he has to keep forcing that over and over again. He did adapt and change. And that did, I think, contribute to some degree to better defensive performance. Like Mike Tomlin, I don't know what you necessarily say is his thing and the stability. Um, John Harbaugh, for example, is much more of a of a CEO type. He's a special teams coordinator. He doesn't call plays on either side, but it's just like a stable force and it's a he's a good listener he really listens to what his players needs he makes adjustments based on what he's what they're good at and what they need to do so there is something about stability and flexibility um but i don't i don't need that from a guy who also calls plays at a mediocre level and all that stuff so like if you are that guy then you really better be really good at hiring offensive and defensive coordinators you better be really good at managing and managing your actual like corporation of coaching staff. Like, I don't know how, how much involvement Matt Eberflus had with handpicking his coaching staff, but one guy was fired for reasons to be known. 
and the other guy is arguably a bottom five offensive coordinator. Players, it was a good call by the by the whoever this coordinator was. That was that would be me. Did you, did you hear that? Well, let me just replay that really quickly. Let me just replay. It's a good call by the by the whoever this coordinator was. That was that would be me. So with whatever stability and play calling ability and all that that you can bring to the table, if you can't manage your own staff at the micro at the macro level, I don't trust that you can like go down all the way into the nitty gritty of your team and on a mic on a uh, micro level be a good manager of like men and all that stuff. They can like you all the, all that you want. Like I do like that uh, Lawrence at one point like worked his way to the nicest way of saying like he's there. <laughs> like hey, <laughs> if you do keep flus, you do need to add a defensive coordinator to the staff and a, a stable offensive coordinator. I mean, I don't think Luke gets you sticking around. I think the, uh, most Bears fans are on the same page there that that needs to change. So with that being said, does anybody come to mind? Yeah, I think defensive coordinator wise, I, I look first at guys currently on the coaching staff. It seems like Iberflus having just been the defensive coordinator all year. I don't know that he's needs to go out and get a totally new outside voice. Like I, I've been asked before, like, you know, Lovey Smith as a possibility there. And I mean, I, I guess, or, I mean, there was talks of him trying to get Rod Marinelli out of retirement, but Rod kind of declined that too. Like, I don't think, I don't think either one of those is super likely, but I mean, right on the coaching staff, they've kind of made John Hoke, the cornerbacks coach. It's kind of felt like he's been the de facto veteran defensive coach that everyone talks to as though he's the defensive coordinator without having any of the defensive coordinator, you know, like pay or title or responsibilities at this point. But I mean, he's been an NFL defensive coordinator before for a few different teams, I believe. And he's certainly been a college defensive coordinator for a long time. And, he, you know, he's a veteran coach. I think he would make a lot of sense in that spot. Also, if that's, the, if that's the case, though, why wouldn't they have promoted him this year? That's a good, that's, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I don't know why, I don't know why they didn't just bother promoting someone this year. I mean, even as an interim defensive coordinator, why, why it, it seems like it would have made sense either way to put someone in that role. The issue with the hiring a guy and promoting within like John Hoke is you look at the position coach that had the most success in theory that season, right? So you look at the quarterback position and yeah, Jalen Johnson had a breakout year. Is that Jalen Johnson being motivated properly by a contract? Or is that because John Hoke all of a sudden just tapped into it perfectly, right? Is Tyreek Stevenson having a really good rookie year on the back end because he just kind of figured it out and he needed to gel with this defense? Or is it John Hoke? So you kind of just target the position group that kind of did well and the guy who has experience. And personally, as a Bears fan, I've seen that done to death. The Mike Tice, the Bob Babbage, the, you know, all these guys that just, oh, well, they're there and their group does well, so we should probably promote them. And I think you have a lot of underlying issues with a with a, a theory like that. That's a good point because the initial offensive staff that Matt Eberflus put together, I don't think he had experience with hardly any of those coaches. Luke Getze, he'd never worked with before, but had heard good things and interviewed him. He did well. Janoko, he had never been on the same team with. Wide receivers coach Tyke Tolbert was totally an outside name. I think tight ends coach Jim Dre was as well. And I, I think offensive line coach Chris Morgan, like all of the key offensive coaches, assistants, and coordinator, like, had not worked together in any capacity and had not worked with Matt Eberflus in any capacity. I don't see how this works, keeping Flus and reshuffling two incredibly vital positions in his staff and giving him the choice to do it. One of the things that I think me and David both kind of despise is draft grades the day after the draft. It's like the day after your fantasy football draft or just right after your fantasy football draft where everybody's got a great team, right? So you, people love to pretend like they know, like everything is what it is and they know what, what's going to happen, but but you don't. So after a year, that's a good time to sit here and kind of take a look back at the draft and some of the rookies that Ryan Poles had drafted last year. And, you know, just to name a couple names, um, Stevenson, Dexter, Pickens, um, Smith, Johnson like Roshan Johnson, Terrell Smith, um, out of all of the rookies last year, which one do you think made the most impact? Which one's your favorite? Who do you think played the best? Yeah, certainly the highest impact was Tyreek Stevenson across the board, like just because you saw the big positive impacts and the big negative impacts. Like Darnell Wright was on the field for more plays. I think he played every game this season and – he didn't play every play. I think he left a time or two with little injuries, but for the most part was was out there all the time and obviously made a big impact. But 
the impact of a cornerback and the impact of a right tackle are a little bit different in terms of positional value there. And to me, it was the four interceptions, but also the handful of times he got burned badly a couple of times for Stevenson that you see the high and low swings of impacts of good and bad on this Bears defense. I ended up being a little bit disappointed in, in Zach Pickens. Not that expectations were ever sky high for the first pick of the third round, but like between he and Jervon Dexter coming in this year, right, right. They're both going to be, you have to be patient with young defensive linemen, especially that, that that position is hard to adapt to quickly to the NFL. But we thought Dexter was the bigger project. He was the one that was coming from a completely different style of defense in Florida, where he's doing a lot more two gapping and not really one gap penetrating at all. And, and they had to reteach him his stance and his, you know, his release from the stance and footwork and hands and pretty much rebuild him from ground up. And yet it was Dexter was the one who seemed to be flashing a lot more and, and having more of those high impact plays, whereas Pickens was supposed to be a little bit more like, pro ready. I mean, without, without trying to expect six sacks from him or anything like that, I just thought, I thought we would see more flashes from him and he was a little bit underwhelming or disappointing for me in that way. And I guess Terrell Smith has a fifth round pick, a late fifth round pick too. Definitely exceeded expectation. Highly as a guy who stepped into the starting lineup late and was taking snaps away from Tyreek Stevenson down the stretch when they were rotating the two of them because Smith was playing so well and Stevenson still had his sense of up and down. But I, I do think overall, really, really strong initial return from that draft class from Ryan Poles where you, you don't really feel like any of the first six picks of that draft, the first round, two seconds, a third and two fourths, like all six of those guys are all at least meeting expectations, if not exceeding expectations. And that's, that's always a good sign. You know, really early on in the season, one of the things that David said was, man, Dexter, he's a little bit more raw than I thought he was like, this guy's yeah. going to take some work. And to his credit, he has applied uh, whatever he was taught and, and has had production on the field because of it. It's pretty much unanimous there. Um, I think it's funny because like we, you know, you open the question with and, how the rookie review goes. It's like, I think Roshan Johnson might've been the favorite, even nationally, like late round pick where everybody's like, I can't believe they got Roshan Johnson. So late, he's going to make such an immediate impact and this and that. And look, and I mean, Roshan was nice and he's fine, but running backs, as we feel personally, me and Paulie speaking, like dime a dozen guys and never really yeah. worth those big $20 million contracts. That they They're not a position that needs to necessarily develop. They could come in and have a huge impact right away yeah, I mean, and he didn't have a huge impact he's solid and he'll probably play really really well next year and if Deontay Foreman tries to you know go get some money somewhere else he probably will and he probably will get that money um you know you'll see more production from Roshan or Khalil Herbert leaving or whatever it is so that's fine uh Roshan was a nice pick um Darnell Wright I think crazy to say that like you're it's almost a slotted in like automatic like yeah he was great it was awesome let's move on next one that was more interesting because to get a right tackle who you just like put in and he was just expected to handle the best pass rusher from that side all season Actually, and he did a damn good job um i think that i was, forgot uh, to put him on the list yeah he's that ingrained and he's that like automatic already right it's just a part of the a line that you don't have to worry about moving forward and that's all you can ever ask for from an early offensive tackle draft right it's just awesome to know that that position's like locked up for five to ten years um dexter man like the first time i i can't remember which game it was but i think he had like three pressures in a row might have been cleveland and i just saw it and i was like oh he got it whatever it was it clicked that day because it was just three plays in a row where he just absolutely pushed that pocket and i think that he's going to have a really good future moving forward um tyreek solid so solid uh terrell smith you know, it's it's awesome to get a rookie, and it's awesome to get him in the fifth round to have those rights controlled. But Terrell Smith is a year older than Tyreek Stevenson already, right? So that's one of those things where it's like it's nice to have a depth piece, but I wouldn't expect much from Terrell Smith like long term on this team. He's twenty four, almost twenty five already. It's one of those like four or five year college starters. So um, great pick, great depth, and I think when you look back and you overall kind of look at one of those these drafts, it's it tends to uh, the flashy. A plus graded like teams tend to not really ever live up to that A plus grade on the day after. And this is kind of why we hate them, right? Because I think if you go and uh, the Bears go and get Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze at, uh, not, at nine, I think that is the quickest A plus we'll ever see on ESPN and PFF and all that immediately. What does that mean? 
absolutely jack shit. That and two quarters give you 50 cents, right? Like Ryan it means Pace absolutely was GM nothing. of the year. Yeah, Ryan, Ryan Pace, Pace was GM of the year, right? 